Good morning, everyone. Good to see you. Good morning, Monica. Thanks, Ken. We love you. We love you so much. Friends, let's stand. For those who can hear me, maybe out in the foyer, come on in. Just going to pray as we open our time together. Lord Jesus, once again this morning, we know and in the throne room, praise hasn't ceased. The angels and the elders are before you, glorifying the lamb that was slain. So we ask you this morning, God, to give us a picture into the throne room. What does that look like? Open our ears to hear the sound of heaven. So I want to magnify Christ in this place. We ask by your spirit, Lord, that you just make Jesus the most beautiful thing. You just empower us, that you'd fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name, for your glory, amen.
broken hearts declare His praise. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is sins of the world, His blood breaks the chains, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb, every knee will bow before Him.
things that you've done yesterday, for all the things that you want to do today, Lord. We just bless you. Let's sing together. Who's moving on the waters? And who is moving on the waters? Who is holding up the moon? Who is peeling back the darkness? With the burning light of noon, standing on. Who is standing on the mountains? Who is on the earth below? Who's bigger than? Who is bigger than the heavens? And the lover of my soul. Let's lift it up together, Creator God. Creator God, He is Yahweh, the great I am, He is Yahweh, the Lock Lord of all, there, where you want He is Yahweh. Uh, wherever, where do you want it? Let's do it, Bale. Thanks very much. Yahweh, Welcome. the righteous Son, He is Yahweh, the three in one, He is Yahweh. My soul sings how we love you. My soul sings. My soul sings. My soul sings how I love you. My soul sings. My soul sings. My soul sings. sings. Let's lift it up, friends. It's our heart cry. We love you, Lord. My soul sings.
soul sings, my soul sings, how I love you, my soul sings, my soul sings, my soul sings. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Jesus, thank you for loving us. We love you. We love you. Take our seats. Thanks, team. We get messages and news from the front lines at Global Harvest all the time of what God is doing around the world. And we thank God for the great work he's doing among our global partners and with our global workers who are making disciples all over the world. Friends, this is family. This is family, and we thank the Lord for what God is doing through our family around the world. I recently, we recently uh, heard of how some of our workers were on the field working in neighborhoods where there is extreme violence and being held up at gunpoint. Recently heard about some of our global workers, our missionaries, who were working faithfully on an island for over 50 years where there was a terrible earthquake, and they were shook awake at night, but yet they after this many years at this age, still serving faithfully for Jesus with complete faith that they know the Lord has them there for a task. Recently got word of a, of a local man being baptized in the Euphrates River where they had to chip through the ice for him to be baptized to say that he wanted to follow Jesus. And now being trained and equipped every week how to lead a body of believers and him now beginning to take that role of leadership and a church is being established in a city that has absolutely no known church and no other believers that are known yet. Stories of our workers serving faithfully to restore drug and alcohol addicts to where they discover their destiny in Jesus Christ and they become discipled, faithful followers of Jesus, being transformed by Jesus, serving faithfully doing that. We hear stories of workers planting churches like we heard about yesterday on remote rivers and remote villages where they serve faithfully seeing the gospel planted and not just being planted but established and then leaders being raised up and being turned over to them to lead these churches that then begin to multiply and send out their own missionaries friends this is family this is family we hear stories of our workers being given opportunity to share the gospel and to share about deliverance from occult practices on local radio and people phoning in and asking for prayer for deliverance. This is what our family is doing around the world and we don't always hear the stories. And friends, we need to grow accustomed to standing behind our family through prayer and through finances even when we don't hear the stories. I could share a hundred stories but I can't even share them all because of security reasons. But we know that God is moving through our family, our workers around the world. Some are here today, and I just pray that you'll take time to be an encouragement to them. I know they'll be an encouragement to you, but many can't be here. Heard last night that from a secure location, last night, 11 of our workers were watching and participating with us through the live stream. From a secure location, and so 
We have family all over the place and they're part of what God is doing in our midst. I guess one of the things that struck me about as I put this together is that I have, a, I have three sons. My wife and I, Brenda and myself, give leadership to ACLP Global Harvest. My youngest son and two of his friends went on YWAM this last year. And you know what? I invested in that. And thank the Lord for what he did through them, uh, through YWAM and in their lives. But you know what? That hasn't stopped me from praying for and standing behind and giving financially to our ACOP workers and missionaries. And that's something I want to encourage us in. You might have all sorts of great opportunities in your churches as, and as individuals to pray for and invest in great work that God is doing around the world. But friends, this is family. This is what ACOP is doing to impact the world. And these are the people that are doing it. So I would love it if we could stand together and have a moment of prayer. So don't stand yet. I'm going to give you some instructions before we get into that. You're just all so willing to follow. I could get quite uh, fiendish with what uh, I have planned. Anyways. What I'd like you to do is to move into groups of three to five people. And friends, I would like us to do war this morning on the behalf of our global workers and their families. Sometimes they feel like they are in a battle. Their stress levels are up to here and beyond. Some of them are facing extreme attack in their ministries, in their families' lives. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to do war on their behalf this morning. Can we do that? So I'd like you to move into groups of three or five. And this video is going to loop through at least one time, probably about one and a half times over the next eight minutes. And what I'd like you to do is mention them by name. Look at some of the prayer requests there. You're going to have to be quick and brief, no sermons in your prayer groups. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to pray for a few things. Besides what's up there, what, what you notice up there, I'd like you to pray for protection, courage, and disciples. Say that with me. Protection, courage, and disciples. They live in hostile, difficult places. And I believe that we can do war on their behalf this morning. Can we do it? Let's stand together, find three or four people, five people. Let's pray together and I'll come up and close in prayer. Let's do war, folks. Let's do, let's do war.
So Jesus, we lift up before you these men and women and these children who are serving faithfully for you on the front lines. And we pray, God, you'd fill them with courage. I pray, God, you'd give them protection. And Lord, we pray for disciples of all nations for ACOP in Jesus' name. Give us the nations, Jesus. Give us the nations. Lord, we want to be able to stand before your throne one day and see the inheritance that has come because of these faithful saints in the name of Jesus. And God, we pray that you'd raise up more workers to go into the harvest field from our midst in the name of Jesus. And we would stand before them faithfully, financially, and in prayer that the nations might see your glory and your fame. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's take our seats. And as you're sitting, I would like anyone here who is an ACOP global worker or is an affiliated, associated a, a worker with ACOP in some way or another, just to stand and we're going to applaud you. So please stand if you're in one of those categories. Woo! Awesome. We are so proud to be part of your family and to have you part of our family. Amen. God bless you. Good morning, everybody. How's my family today? Bless you guys. Just a few reminders. I know I sound like a broken record, but the social media, we've got lots of people that are watching um, the live stream. So hi, everybody. We're missing you. Wish you were here. Next time you should be here. Um, the, the social media, the Whova, if you can take your pictures, tweet using the hashtag ACO, or hashtag ACOP conference, any of those things are included in our loop and that, that would really be uh, fun. I don't know if you're watching out in the foyer, all of the pictures that are looping. And so if you can, re just a reminder to please get engaged, do that. Um, Dr. Clark has asked me to remind you that his book sales will be open before and after each session, and he will be doing a book signing this evening at 6.30, so he'd asked me just to mention that to you as well. I think really that's all I need to say at this point, so I'll ask Wes to come up. Thanks, Darla. Winston, are you in the building? Can you come on up? There he is. Come on up, Winston. Uh, we had, uh, as you know, an awards night on uh, Monday night, and uh, we were planning to uh, give a special award to uh, Winston Cross, but there was some flight problems. He didn't get in until much later than he'd planned, and uh, so we weren't able to present him the award, but I wanted to do it this morning. So Winston, if you'll come on up here. I'm going to read the commendation that, uh, that I put together, so I just thought it was better to do it that way. So Winston, on behalf of the Apostolic Church of Pentecost, we want to recognize your many years of faithful service to the Southern Alberta District and to our ACOP Fellowship. Ontario. You've Southern Ontario District. <laughs> hey, I know where Alberta is. <laughs> we found out our Prime Minister knows where it is today too, so. You've served our fellowship as a pastor, church planter, Bible college teacher, Bible college president, camp speaker, conference speaker, presbyter, and district director. As we move into a new season in ACOP, your role as district director is coming to an end, and we wanted to take this opportunity to honor you, to thank you, and to commend you for your significant contributions to ACOP over many years. We know that God will continue to use you to extend grace and to ignite hope with love and appreciation. Amen. You may be seated. I want to uh, introduce uh, some people to you this morning. Uh, 
for about a 10 minute presentation. Um, we're glad to have Brian Fuller, who's the president of the Eston College, formerly Full Gospel Bible Institute. And uh, Brian and Josh are going to come and do a presentation, but the chairman of the Eston College Board has joined us. Monty, would you stand up and give everybody a wave? Monty's a great chairman, great promoter of the college. As Brian and Josh are coming, I just want to say that Brian's been the president of Eston College for 10 years. And uh, if you know anything about Brian Fuller, you'll know he's committed to discipleship. And uh, that's, that's what beats in Brian's heart every day, and he disciples young men and women at the college. So uh, God bless you gentlemen, we're glad to have you here. Let us tell us what's happening at the college. Look at this, man, these guys are cool. <laughs> it's the skinny jeans. I started two months after Brian did, 10 years ago now, and I didn't think that I'd have to become an expert in gender studies. And all kinds of identity issues. I, I, I got my master's degree in New Testament. And it speaks to those things so clearly. But do you understand? Our students, they don't understand how relevant scripture is. I'm going to a wedding this weekend for Tristan McCracken. From Ogama. Tristan. I've never met a young man who's so full of doubt. But let me tell you something, when he went on Street Invaders and, and on our contact teams and what he has experienced, seeing miracles, has transformed his faith. So that even though his head doesn't understand, his heart and his hands do. Do you get it? Because what Randy Clark said last night is what we need in our day. Not just the word, but the spirit and the word in combination bringing forth miraculous power that kids can't deny. And so Tristan now serves at his church. He's running the youth group, and it's like full of Filipino kids who don't know Christ. And he preaches once a month. And Tristan, he breaks my heart every time I think about him because he's still struggling to get it in his head, but he can't help but serve because his, his life has been transformed by seeing the power of Christ. And that's what our kids need now, not just ideas, but the power of Jesus encountering Christ. And that's why I'm a part of Aston College. It's the spirit and the word, and that's what we stand for, and that's what we will die for. Thank you. I love being one with all of you in Christ. At Eston College, we want to supplement the teaching a person receives in his or, home, his or her home church or their, um, where, they, you know, where they're attending, camps, wherever they come from. We are a team who is utterly dependent on the Holy Spirit. When Christ said he could do nothing without the Father, we identify with that. We revere the Word of God and we strongly emphasize discipleship. Our prayer is that all who are part of the college daily, uh, who are part of Eston College will daily abandon themselves to Christ and faithfully practice all that he's taught us in his word. Because it's a place of learning and because God is gracious, mistakes are not frowned on. So when we practice the gifts of the Spirit, um, mistakes are made. Our students come from various backgrounds. Some have great familiarity with Christ, others have little. Some speak English fluently, others less so. Some have strong family support, and others come and Eston College becomes their family. Every organization has a culture that influences the world around it. And here are some of the foundational cornerstones of the culture of Eston College. And just a few of the things, just a few of the things we teach. And let me just say, it's not an exhaustive list by any means. We teach this, that the Bible is the inerrant authoritative word of God. And then we provide multitudes of opportunities for our students to read and study the Bible every day so that they can become acquainted with the voice of God, so that they can know his character and nature, and so that they can do the works that he's prepared for them. We teach our students that the best way to conquer the incessant demands of our unruly flesh is to daily live surrendered to Christ who indwells them. 
we teach them that we're saved by God's grace through faith and it's not of works. We also teach them that as Christians we're kept by God's grace. We teach them that it's biblical to operate in all the gifts of the Spirit. We cherish and value our statement of faith and we encourage you to check out our website for a complete list of those things that undergird our mission and our ministry. Now, can I encourage you, folks, to invite those that you influence every day to spend at least a year in Eston College. Our promise to you is that we will faithfully serve you, whether you send us young people or older people. We want to further prepare them to meet the needs of your church, your community, and of our world. And we in no way want to undermine or under or replace your role in the lives of these young people. We want to help strengthen their relationship with Christ and further develop their character and their spiritual influence. And here's just some of the reasons that we encourage those that are under your care to attend the college. One, it will further expose them to and provide them with the opportunity to practice the spiritual gifts. We're just a place for that, and we allow that. It'll fortify their resolve to own their own theology, their own faith, and it will help them develop a good Christian worldview, a right Christian worldview. Bible college is a great gateway for entering other post-secondary institutions or the job market. It will provide opportunities to, to discover their role in the body of Christ, whether they're going to be a pastor, a church planter, missionary, evangelist, apostle, teacher, or prophet. And Bible college helps solidify the foundation needed for marriage, career ministry, in their influence, hearing God's voice, prayer, relationships, problem solving, leadership, conflict resolution, raising children, critical thinking, and that's just a few of them. If you have any questions, please feel free to approach those of us who have been privileged to join you, and it has been a privilege. And ask us anything about the college. I'd like to introduce just a few, Jeff and Brenda Frost. If you would stand, you can ask them questions. Josh, you just met, and I'm here. And Gary's, uh, Brenda's brother, Gary Stevenson, is here. So if you have questions, ask us. And just one more thing, we have a short clip dealing with various programs and events that are part of the college, and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. One thing that I loved about Biblical Studies is that it allowed me to learn how to grow in a community of people. Because of Biblical Studies, I grew deeper in knowledge of who He is, but also who I am in Him. I like ESL because ESL is not just simply learn English, but also experience Canadian culture. ESL is a good place to learn English. I joined the GO program because I love the idea of practically applying what I'm learning in classes to the real world. We got to see God's heart and we got to see God in the small things. Gideon's Call helped me learn how to step out in the gifts that God has given me. I like Gideon's Call because it not only helped me grow musically but also in community and ministry. Mother's Life gives you the opportunity to grow in missions and evangelism. Martyr's Life is the book of Acts becoming your daily reality. It connects small teams with Christian mentors in real-world ministry fields. What I like about Watt Teams is it gives students an opportunity to experience different parts of the world. The Lord really still works in other nations and it's beneficial that Christians see what the Lord does outside of Canada and outside of North America in general. Faith in Motion is a time where we get together in small groups and we either practice public speaking, memorization, journaling, sharing what God has shown us in our Bible reading. Making private practices public. Every year we put on several conference weekends for both young adults and for youth. 
and it's really just a weekend of putting everything else aside just to rest and rejoice in God's presence while making connections with both old and new friends. Rooted in scriptures and prayer. Refreshing. It helped me develop a healthy lifestyle. Stretching. It's a good place for discipleship. It has been a blessing. Fun. It changed my life. Epic. It's my privilege to introduce our next speaker. Bill, why don't you just come up and stand beside me so they can study you while I'm talking about you. Uh, Bill Hogg will minister to us. Uh, Bill is from Scotland. If you are a football fan, you'll want to talk to him, but uh, don't make any bets. Okay. And, uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, as long as you tithe to the offering. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. I thought the stewardship guy would be more enthusiastic. He's like, sure. You'll get to know Bill really quick. Uh, his official title right now, he's a catalyst with the C2C Church Planning Network. Uh, he's ministered in youth ministry and, and, and in churches in Great Britain, in the United States, and in Canada. Uh, he has uh, a doc, his latest doctorate is, has to do with how local churches can be transformed into more missional communities. He's an evangelist at heart, and uh, he lives really close to me. Uh, we live in the good part of the country, yeah. and, uh, the best, right? That's right, absolutely. This man's a wise man, yeah. <laughs> He's just catching on now. Good. Yeah. This is Bill. He's going to really share with you. He will uh, bring great uh, change into your life, and we're glad you're here. Bless you. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Stan. I'm glad Stan clarified something early on there that I'm from Scotland because I still find people are clueless and they'll tell me where I'm from. So we arrived at uh, Regina Apostolic Church. When was that? A week ago, a couple of days ago. And we were greeted by Colonel Sanders and his wife, which was <laughs> awesome. Be beautiful couple. I asked them for the secret ingredient. <laughs> and he said, it's the anointing of God, young man. <laughs> but uh, a delightful couple, but Brother Switzer are lacking in intercultural intelligence. <laughs> so he's telling me where I'm from. He here's something, this won't get you into heaven, it won't give you more of the Holy Ghost, but it'll help you get on with foreigners a lot better. <laughs> Don't tell them where they're from. <laughs> Ask them. <laughs> and God bless him, Brother Switzer, I mean, he said, you're from Ireland. I said, no. And then he still continued, are you from the north or the south? I said, I'm from Scotland. <laughs> so, delightful, gracious, but lacking in intercultural intelligence. I was in Seattle, Washington several years ago waiting for drugs, uh, <laughs> prescription drugs. And I was at the pharmacist, uh, pharmacy talking to the pharmacist, and uh, an old lady started interrupting. She was in a chair. I thought she was dead and decomposing, but actually, <laughs> actually, she being dead yet speaketh. And uh, she shook off rigor mortis and said, you're from the old sad, aren't you? Now, I was brought up, don't interrupt old people because they might die. So, uh, 
I just let her continue to flap her toothless gums in my direction. I said, excuse me, she said, you're from Ireland, aren't you? I said, no. She said, are you sure? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, but that's okay. I mean, the Scots and the Celts, we are barbarians. Uh, we're the ones that learned how to swim. The Irish are the less intelligent ones stuck on that emerald isle. But the ultimate insult, of course, would be when we moved to Seattle, Washington, came to North America in 1995, I thought it would be great that we wouldn't spend any money on furniture, you know, because there's Mennonites who are tight, there's Dutch who are stingy, and then there's the Scots. And so I thought, why don't we just save money for other things and let the kids sleep on the floor? It'll build character. And uh, <laughs> my wife wasn't persuaded by that suggestion, so we did go furniture shopping, and we came into a furniture store. And immediately a woman came into my bubble, right? So she's right in my face. And she said, what part of England are you from? <laughs> I said, I'm not from England and I won't be buying any of your crap furniture. Thank you very much. I'll even go into St Starbucks, and then there's some hopped up barista with skinny jeans that make my eyes water. <laughs> and he's got metal jingle jangling from various parts of his face. He'll say, what part of Australia are you from? <laughs> I say, I'm not from that penal colony, thank you very much. <laughs> Scottish rugby team were touring Australia several years ago and they came to customs and immigration. I, I don't know what they say at customs and immigration, what their repertoire is, but it might be Tommy Kangaroo Downsport, good eye, Waltzing Matilda. Uh, but they asked one of the rugby players, you got a criminal record? He said, why? Is it still mandatory? So, <laughs> So I grew up in Scotland, bounced in and out the United States of America, God bless America, and no place else, and bounced backwards and forwards because my dad worked for IBM, which I thought stood for I've been moved. <laughs> and uh, signed up at a camp, kind of last minute thing, got hijacked by Jesus at a camp, Came back to Scotland, drifted. Jesus hijacked me in my final year of high school. And I thought I'll be an engineer and make lots of money. And when I was studying engineering, Jesus hijacked me again, baptized me in the Holy Spirit. Game changer. And now I'm in Canada via the United States. I'm thoroughly confused and disoriented. But the point is this, God has a redemptive plan. And he's orchestrating circumstances according to his redemptive agenda. And he might put your postcode in the shredder and give you a zip code. He might put your five-year plan, carefully constructed with Crayola crayons, in the shredder. Because what he wants to do is work through you, around you, in spite of you, for his glory and for the fame of his dear son, the Lord Jesus, and for the redemption of the nations. And we're here in this place for such a time as this. As Stan mentioned, I'm part of C2C Network. Now, we get our name from Psalm 72, verse 8, despite the fact our name is letter C, number 2, letter C. was up? 
C2C. <laughs> More Lord. Okay, there you go. In Psalm 72, verse 8 says that he shall have dominion from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. Now, the fascinating thing about a Scotsman who has a UK passport, a US passport, and various other ones I can't tell you about because I'm like Jason Bourne, I would have to kill you. <laughs> you know this because you're an avid student of Canada that tattooed on the parliament building is Psalm 72, verse 8. And sometimes as a team, we'll sit around drinking Starbucks coffee because Tim Hortons isn't coffee. And we'll say, yeah, amen. That's right. I don't know what Tim Hortons is. I'm waiting on the forensics coming back from the lab. But we'll sit around and say, what's the bullseye? What are we all about as a network? And some of our team will say, church planting, ah, thanks for playing. Some will say multiplication, which is more nuanced. Ah, no, we're about missions. No, we're about Jesus. Psalm 72, verse 8, that he, King Jesus, the Lamb of God who was slain before the foundation of the world, resurrected according to the good plan and purpose of the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit, that he would have dominion, that his glory and fame would spread from sea to sea. So currently we work with 31 evangelical denominations because did you know God's sandbox is bigger than ACOP? It's bigger than Mennonite Brethren, thankfully. It's bigger than Southern Baptist, North American Baptist, Fellowship Baptist, fighting punch you in the eye Baptist. It's bigger <laughs> than all of them. And what are we about? We're about the glory and fame of Jesus. Church planting is a redemptive means to an end. And we're about assessing, coaching, training, supporting church planters. Currently in Canada, we've got 120 church planters and apprentices we're supporting. And in the US, we became binational oh, about 18 months ago, 22. But God's got so much more. That's a good story, but God has so much, so, so much more because Canada is a lost nation going to hell in a handbasket. It's a beautiful nation. But it's a broken nation. It's a confused nation. It's a lost nation. And when Jesus looks out at Canada, he's moved in his guts with compassion because most Canadians are bumping and grinding and stumbling around in the dark like sheep without a shepherd. But we're seeing some beautiful things happen, even although God's got so much more. So in Quebec, where the Lundgrens are, which is the most unevangelized piece of real estate in all of the Americas, North, Central, South America, where there are less evangelical, visible adherents of Jesus than there are in the Islamic Republic of Pakistan. Islamic Republic of Pakistan, 0.6% evangelical. Post-Christian, Quebec, about 0.5%. So, if you've lost the plot and lost sight of Jesus' mission in Luke 19, verse 10, where he says, the man from heaven came to seek and to save that which was lost. Maybe go and wander the streets of Montreal or Quebec City. About four years ago, our regional director was coaching four church planters. That's like a part-time gig, you slacker. Now he's run off his feet, coaching 24. And if you asked Patrice, what's happening? He would say, the Lord is answering the prayers of his people. <laughs> he 
You say, what do you mean by that? He said, the Lord's answering 1002 prayer. So every day at 1002, our iPhones will go off in our pocket, not our Samsung Galaxies, because then our leg would go on fire. And that's a reminder of Jesus' words, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. What did he say? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So we hit the pause button and pray. And Patrice is quite convinced that the Lord is inclined towards 1002 prayer. And we would invite you to join us in 1002 prayer. And if you're hardcore, you could set your iPhone at 10.02 p.m. and (laughs) double-double. And ask Jesus, who is the Lord of the harvest, to disrupt men and women in their quiet religious routines and barf them out into the harvest fields by the power of the Holy Spirit, (laughs) where they'd be gospel torchbearers. So one of our church planters in uh, Montreal is David Merck. And I remember David Merck coming through assessment center and he made the mistake of preaching from his iPhone because we assess. And for some reason they put the Scotsman in the francophone stream to assess Quebecois preachers preaching en français s'il vous plaît. And the problem is they thought I had more French than I really do. And apparently I can speak what little French I have in a French accent. I just channel my Inspector Clouseau and we're good to go. (laughs) And so I don't know if he's preaching heresy or not. And I'm there with Mark Pion. He says, don't worry, brother. He's not a heretic. He is gospel centered. I said, good, that's good to know. But what I remember, David Merck preaching on his iPhone and his workaholic senior pastor texting him things to do during assessment center. And he's he's kind of twitching behind the pulpit. (laughs) But he survives and he gets a green light. And he draws people together. They pray. They have a core team. They set a launch date for going public with the gospel. And because he's mobilized his launch team to share their faith and share their story and invite people, they book a room that could hold 120. 400 people show up. And because he's Pentecostal and he doesn't know any better, what does he do? He preaches Jesus and calls them to Jesus. Because I asked him, So 400 showed up. What did you do? I said, I preached Jesus. I called them to Jesus. And 25 of them gave their lives to Jesus. Fast forward last October, my old neighbor, who's a wild man evangelist, engaging in mission amongst the homeless in Wally in Surrey, the poorest and most violent postal code in the city of Surrey. He's over there and he preaches and they lost track of how many people came to Christ that Sunday. Gave up counting after 50 because they're not good at arithmetic in (laughs) Quebec. So God's at work. Even in dark places, we remind ourselves Jesus does his best stuff in a graveyard. And lots of young adults are hearing the voice of Jesus, Lazarus, come forth. But God's got so much more. We're in a pivotal moment in time. A Kairos moment. For the nation of Canada and for the ACOP tribe, it's a Kairos moment. See, in the Bible, there's two kinds of time. There's Kronos. What time is it? Like last night, what time is that? Will Randy Clark finish? No, no, no. (laughs) So I've got permission to go for about 98 minutes this morning. (laughs) What time's the ball game? What time will we meet for coffee? That's Kronos time. But then there's a different kind of time. Freighted with 
divine significance. So we see this, for example, in John's gospel, Jesus shows up at a wedding reception. They couldn't have been Pentecostals uh, because they'd run out of wine. (laughs) And, And his mother puts one on him and says, what are you going to do about it? They've run out of wine. And then he gives her a great answer which would have got me a black eye from my mother. (laughs) My dear woman, my hour has not yet come. Wow. (laughs) Then moments later, he's bossing people around with huge water containers, and he transforms flat, scummy water into the best wine they've ever tasted. My hour has not yet come. John 7 His half-brothers are saying, if you really want to be big man on campus, you've got to head up to Jerusalem. And he says, my hour has not yet come. For you, any time will do. And then he comes to the climax as he's confronted with the shadow of the cross where Jesus takes our sin, death, judgment, and hell upon himself and disarms principalities and powers. And he says, now my hour has come. Now, the prince of this world is cast out. So it's a a pivotal time for the nation. It's a pivotal time for ACOP. It's a Kairos moment. And what might the Lord say to us in this Kairos moment? I invite you to turn to Isaiah 54, which is page 736 in your stolen Gideon Bible (laughs) that you took out the Marriott because you thought they won't miss it. Isaiah 54, verse 1. Sing, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Burst into song. Shout for joy, you who were never in labor. Because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent. Stretch your tent curtains wide. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. Strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in desolate cities. Do not be afraid. You will not be put to shame. Do not fear disgrace. You will not be humiliated. You will forget the shame of your youth and remember no more the reproach of your widowhood. For your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. He is called the God of all the earth. The Lord will call you back as if you were a wife deserted and distressed in spirit. A wife who married young, only to be rejected, says your God. For a brief moment, I abandoned you, but with deep compassion, I will bring you back. In a surge of anger, I I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness, I will have compassion on you, says the Lord, your Redeemer. To me, this is like the days of Noah when I swore that the waters of Noah would never again cover the earth. So now I have sworn not to be angry with you, never to rebuke you again. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken. Nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. Afflicted city, lashed by storms and not comforted. I will rebuild you with stones of turquoise, your foundations with lapis lazuli. I will make your battlements of rubies, your gates of sparkling jewels, and all your walls of precious stones. All your children will be taught by the Lord, and great will be their peace. In righteousness you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. If anyone does attack you, it will not be my doing. Whoever attacks you will surrender to you. See, it is I who created the blacksmith who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work, and it is I who created the destroyer to wreak havoc. No weapon forged against you will prevail, and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. So here's the people of God in exile, distressed, dispossessed. They can't ignite hope 
because hope has vaporized. And they've come to the unsettling conclusion that Yahweh has forsaken them, has abandoned them. But here's a promise of a divine reversal, a glorious reversal of fortunes, fruitfulness of restoration. And there's three metaphors used here. There's a barren woman, and it's a gynecological impossibility for her to give birth. And then she shouts and sings for joy, not because of the birth of a single child, but because multitudes are born. There's a metaphor of a, a young wife abandoned, deserted by her husband early in their life together. And God says, with compassion, I will return to you. And then there's a city that's been trashed and plundered. It's a desolate wasteland. And God says, I'm going to rebuild it with precious jewels. The desolate woman experiences a breakthrough. And we desperately need a, a breakthrough in North America and in Canada today. Because when we look at the Church of Christ with capital C from coast to coast, we say largely she looks like a barren woman. If we're being honest, if we have the courage to confront the brutal facts instead of hiding behind hyper-spiritualization and we actually take an unblinking look at reality, realizing we've got to get a handle on point A before, by God's grace, we can discern where point B might possibly be, we discover that in Canada, about 85% of churches have plateaued or declined. And that's only using attendance as a metric, not the most helpful metric. But it gives us a clue numerically that most churches had their heyday in yesteryear. And you could buck that trend and become part of the slightly happier 15% if a family decides they've had enough of Regina and moves to Calgary. And they say, we're moving on up. <laughs> Whoa, there we go. Hey, build a bridge, get over it. So if we, if we think about that 15%, you know, say 15% of churches are growing, but then we need to ask what kind of growth? And we'll talk about this tomorrow morning. Largely transfer growth. Largely sheep shuffling. Largely church switching. Disgruntled sheep, meh, our pastor sucks, meh. And, and then they come grazing in your field. And, and because you're addicted to approval, you go, oh, come on. Come into my paddock with a wandering wham. Here, <laughs> let me hug you. When I was in pastoral ministry several years ago, by God's mercy, I am no longer so. Uh, we used to do dessert nights in our home for newcomers. But I thought, desserts suck. So we did pizza with the pastor. It's kind of alliterative. It'll almost preach. Pizza with the pastor. Propitiation. Yeah, that, that'll preach. And so we'd have them over to our home. And pizza's a good sociable food. You know, people get up for more. The gluttons come and they want eight pieces of pepperoni. And, but it's a good mixer. But then say, what brought you here? And I remember... The last church we pastored, the last two pizza parties at the pastor's palace. One of them, a guy said, I'm a train wreck. I'm here because I need God and I can't figure it out. The subsequent one, a guy said, you know, I'm clean and sober for a few months or a few years now, but more than that. I need to figure out what God has for me. But other than that, it was people from other churches. Now we know God can relocate people for the sake of the mission to join your team. And we know, as an American sociologist told me, 
transfer growth. But what if someone who's lukewarm, nominal, or disconnected from Jesus moves to another church and their faith in Christ comes alive? I thought, okay, you win that argument. But it hides us from the greater painful truth that largely for all our resources, for all the deployment of personnel on the ground, for all our programs, largely we're a barren, a barren woman. Neil Cole says, the Southern Baptists have said that only 4% of churches in America will plant a daughter church. That means 96% of the conventional churches in America will never give birth. Based on experience, I believe this statistic is true. Even worse, I suspect that the majority of the 4% who do give birth will do so in unwanted pregnancies, which we call church splits. So that's the bad news. And sometimes before we can savor the good news and marinate in the power of the good news, we've got to wake up to the bad news. And the good news in Isaiah 54 is there's a barren woman who bursts forth in uninhibited shouting and singing for joy because she's experienced the stigma and shame of childlessness, the disappointment of an empty nursery, and then given a summons from the Lord to build a huge tent to contain all the offspring that the Lord will give her. So who is this barren woman who experiences a divine reversal? The NIV, which is the nearly infallible version, uh, has a, an unhelpful, kind of helpful footnote that suggests maybe it's Hannah. So in microscopic font, you have to go back to 1 Samuel 2 verse 7, which is part of Hannah's prayer. And you'll remember Hannah, who was goaded by her rival Penina, the whiner. And Penina was always taunting her, treated her with contempt because Hannah was childless. So that was stigma enough. And the scripture says, in his sovereignty, it was God who closed her, her womb. But there's a social stigma then there's Penina just battering her ears with contempt and insult. And in her distress, she cries out to the Lord. Now, this is a passage that has some significance in my story because my mother was told by doctors, you'll never have children based on your health. And she said, Lord, if you give me sons, I'll give them back to you to preach the gospel. So, I love that story, but I think we've got to go further back to the story of Sarah, who's just phoning in now from Ur of the Chaldees. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, just take your time. I've got 97 minutes, so we're good to go. So in Genesis 12, there's a moon-worshiping pagan called Abram, and God disrupts him and sends him to an unknown destination for the blessing of the nations. So they're disrupted, they're upended. God will bless them so that they will be a blessing, and that blessing will be global. And in Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, as Abram's getting older and more decrepit and less virile and grumpier and more arthritic and more hemorrhoidal, <laughs> the Lord reminds him the promise. Look at, look at the stars. Psalm is cue for a Coldplay song. Look at the stars, see how they shine for you. Count them. And everyone goes, wow. He's overwhelmed because they're countless. And another time, God takes him to the beach 
And he says, see all these grains of sand? Count them. I can't. Okay. Such will be your descendants. Such will be the scope of the blessing that will permeate through your family line. And they're getting old. Old, old. And the Lord reminds them of the promise. And now they're well into their ninth decades, respectively. When God reminds Abram the promise in Genesis 15, he bursts out laughing. And Sarah snickers, maybe out of disbelief, out of cynicism. Yeah, right, have you seen this? Withered old wineskin. How's that going to work? That's why they called him boy Isaac, the son of promise, means laughter. And I think Isaiah is thinking back to a barren woman who has countless descendants. There's an explosion of new life in Isaiah 54. And maybe we're on the cusp of something glorious where from coast to coast we'll see an explosion of new life, where we'll step into a season of unprecedented harvest. And the challenge is, are we ready for it? Are we expectant of that? Or have the bumps and scrapes and bruises of ministry knocked out appropriate gospel optimism and expectancy that the God who could raise his son, the Lord Jesus, from the dead, the God who could enable Abram and Sarah after they tried to do it in their own strength could empower them to be a blessing to the nations. What we're confronted with in Isaiah 54 is the breathtaking possibility of kingdom multiplication, an explosion of new life. We look at the rapid growth of the early church, the historian Rodney Stark tells us that at the end of the first century, there was maybe 50,000 disciples, like 50,000 genuine, real McCoy, real deal, full-on followers of Jesus. AD 400, 34 million people profess faith in Jesus. How is that possible? An explosion of new life, rapid kingdom multiplication. Isaiah 54 speaks to increase in abundance, speaks to an explosion of new life. The word of the Lord is expand. And just to reinforce that, he says, do not hold back. Isaiah 54 scans our hearts and raises the question, what is the level of expectancy What's your level of expectancy? Do you believe God could shake your town, your village, your city? Do you believe that Jesus could change the social, political, spiritual, religious, cultural climate in Canada? Do you believe that? And it also raises the question of your focus. Because the focus here is babies. The focus here is radical restructuring, expansion, moving around the flaps of your tent, extending your tent, and making sure it's tethered, safe in the ground for the sake of new life. What's your focus? Because you can get duped into gathering a crowd and thinking you're getting the job done, but we're not seeing new life. And we're not seeing exponential kingdom growth. And we're not seeing the breakthrough that the barren woman experienced. Errol Kreps uh, was a church planting catalyst for the Assemblies of God in the United States. And part of a catalyst job is to buy lunch, breakfast, dinner with church planters, church planting couples, and coach them and encourage them and pick up the tab. And he would show up at different gatherings. Then he would take the planters out for lunch. And we would always ask them this question, which is a great question that raises the issue of external focus and missional engagement. He would say to these planters, and he memorably tells the story of the coolest planter you could ever meet. 
cargo pants, appropriate footwear, awesome tattoos, piercings, and shaved head. Hello, I am the embodiment of cultural relevance. And he asked this guy, <laughs> how many people in your congregation were never part of a faith community before you launched? And he said, I don't know. I don't know. And El Krebs said, of all the planters, he asked that question, only two could give him an, an answer. All the rest was, I don't know. I don't know. And we can get duped by building a show, by having a great gathering. The most anointed, the most rocked out, the most crazy gathering in all of the province. But are we experiencing the influx of new life? And so Isaiah 54 says, get ready for a wild influx. And you say, well, how can we do that? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> Firstly, dream a bigger dream. Marinate in Isaiah 54 and dream a bigger dream. William Carey wrongly has been labeled the father of Protestant foreign missions. He was a shoemaker and he got up to his Baptist fraternal and there's all these Baptist pastors uh, flapping their gums at each other. And he got up and he raised the question, what about the heathen? And an old fellow got up and said, young Mr. Carey, well, you know, if they call you young Mr. Anything, you're going to get a put down. He said, young Mr. Carey, sit down. If the Lord chooses to save the heathen. He will do so without your help or mine. So there's an unhappy theological construct to support missional disengagement and passivity. But undeterred, he founded a mission society, and the sermon that launched the society was from Isaiah 54. Expect great things from God, Kerry said. Attempt great things from God. So here in Isaiah 54, we see a supernatural reversal of fortunes. It's not down to you or me. It's the work of God. God supernaturally creates a totally different scenario. The barren woman loses track of her offspring. There's restoration and there's city transformation. Dream a bigger dream fueled by the greatness of God. Dream a bigger dream fueled by the supremacy of Jesus. So right next door to Isaiah 54 is Isaiah 53, arguably the most Christ-centered passage in all of the Old Testament, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He carried our sins, our sickness, our sorrows. And on and on it goes. The beauty and power of the suffering servant who laid down his life for us. And more than that, was raised to life because it says in Isaiah 53, 10, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And here come the offspring in Isaiah 54. So we've got to invite the spirit of God to ravage our hearts and take the scales off our eyes so that we see the beauty and power and sufficiency and supremacy of Jesus and say, Lord, my dreams are lame. Give me your dream for the fame of Jesus. We sang it this morning. Randy Clark quoted it last night. The Moravians had a gospel mantra that the lamb who was slain might receive the fruit of the reward of his suffering. And perhaps since the days of the early church, they are the wackiest, craziest, most radical missionary movement. Birthed in a hundred year prayer movement. And they were so sold out to gospel advancement as Anglo-Saxon, Caucasian Germans, that they would sell themselves into slavery so they could take the gospel to places that they were forbidden to go. Why? Why? That the lamb who was slain might receive the fruit of the reward of his suffering. It's the Moravians that unnerved and unraveled John Wesley. John Wesley is an Anglican, 
unregenerate missionary going to the Americas to evangelize the Indians. And it was such a disappointing exercise in futility. He wrote in his journal, I went to save the Indians, but oh God, who will convert me? And on the way over, the boat's almost scuttled by a storm. And Wesley's freaking out because he thinks he'll get sucked into the ocean, get eaten by a kraken, and end up in hell. Moravians are like, bring it on, sink the boat, Jesus, we love you. And they're pumped at the prospect of being catapulted into the arms of Jesus. And they had a huge impact on John Wesley. Historians tell us the only thing that saved England from a bloody revolution like the French bloody revolution was the evangelical awakening under the Wesleyan. who had a vision of scriptural holiness being spread across the land. That's a big dream. Dream a bigger dream. Secondly, increase your redemptive capacity. Isaiah 54, two to three says, enlarge the place of your tent, stretch your tent curtains wide, do not hold back, lengthen your cords, strengthen your stakes, for you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in desolate cities. So I can't tell you what that means for you. So pray. Ask the Lord, what does it mean for you personally in your context to expand your redemptive capacity? But I would ask you, where is church planting and multiplication on your radar? If we're talking about a wild influx and we're talking about increasing our redemptive capacity, church planting's got to be on the table as part of the conversation. Why? Because I'm a church planting bigot? Yep. <laughs> no, because Brother Switzer's doppelganger, Peter Wagner, said the most effective evangelism methodology under heaven is church planting. That's why. Tim Keller says, studies confirm that the average new church gains a third to two-thirds of its new members from the ranks of people who are not attending any worshiping body. While well, churches over 10 to 15 years of age gain 80 to 90% of new members from transfers from other churches. If you want to increase your capacity for kingdom advancement and new life, multiply. Get into the church planting game and don't come up with excuses. Don't come up with excuses. So, I consult, kind of side thing as part of my role with churches about church planting. They invite me in, so there's a pastor, he's a friend of mine of several years, and he said, yeah, the Lord told me when we get to 1,200, then we could plant. Well, I can't argue with the Lord, right? I won't win that argument, but it, it sniffed, smelled a little off to me. It, it, didn't, it didn't feel like a, a word from the Lord because Hugh Morrison and the Maritimes, a church of 120. And they planted three churches. One collapsed because a bunch of carnal Christians, if there are such a thing, invaded the thing and made it toxic and smelly. But if you're 120 and you can plant, it's to do with intent and desire. I can serve with a church that I, I dearly love or respect the leadership. They've got a huge war chest that you would give your left arm for. Big, big amount of money dedicated to church planting, they haven't spent a wooden nickel. And the elders are saying, no, you know, we've got to hold steady. You know, church of 2000, we've got to hold steady. Rather than recognizing if you want to see kingdom growth, it involves multiplication. And the elders are fixated on growth by addition. I met with a large church, huge church, biggest church in a city in North, its particular city in North America. And it's the church where disgruntled evangelicals show up all the time. It's a conveyor belt. And they planted their church. And I said, honestly, if you want to change the culture in here, you need to plant like five or six churches before anything changes. And they just thought it was a, a wombat speaking Swahili. Bob Roberts claims the future of the faith in America 
and anywhere in the world for that matter is not tied to planting more churches, but in the raising up of mother congregations of every tribe, tongue, denomination, and network that are reproducing like rabbits. Until that happens, we are only a dream waiting to happen. So quickly, before we land the plane, thirdly, catch God's heart for cities and nations. Did you catch that as we read Isaiah 54? Cities mentioned 1,250 times in the Bible. North America is an urban story. 81% of Canadians live in a town or a city. 82% of people in the US. It, North America is an urban story. Cities are strategic. We have an urban God who wants to see cities transformed. And the question is, are you building a great church where you are, or are you out and about building a great city? One of our most fruitful church planters in our network left his church plant after he dotted a congregation about five years in. Why? Because he wants to pastor the city. He wants to sow the gospel into the seven spheres of culture in his particular community. Did you hear God's heart for the nations? The call to Sarah and Abram has to do not simply with the forming of Israel, but with the reforming of creation and the transforming of nations, says Walter Brueggemann. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. Your descendants will dispossess nations and settle in their desolate cities. A hundred cities globally represent 30% of the global economy. Cities are huge engines of innovation. Now in our planet, we have super cities, mega cities, and hyper cities. There's 33 mega cities on the planet, which have a population of equal to or more than 10 million. Five million people every month move into a sizable city. That's a new San Francisco every month, a new Scotland every month, freedom every month, <laughs> a new Bangkok every two months. How will you respond to the challenges and opportunities of the city? Cities are strategic in Jesus' mission. Why? They are disproportionately populated with the next generation of young people and young adults. So if you want to go after the 414 window, go after the cities. Waves of least reached people have washed into our cities through this diaspora, through this scattering their global catch basins. You go to Tirana, it's the most multicultural, multinational city on the planet. 52% of the population of Toronto were born outside of Canada. And I think the 911 operators can respond in 140 different languages. And that's that huge sprawl, the golden horseshoe, 6.7, 6.97 million and counting, whatever the latest. But you go to Morden in southern Manitoba, a city of 9,000, and there the city leaders are intentionally wooing and recruiting Filipino immigrants. Why? Because they come from strong family structures. They've got a great work ethic. They're diligent and they're pleasant. I mean, who doesn't want pleasant workers in the workforce? <laughs> you go to Edmonton if you want to reach Somalians. You go to Winnipeg if you want to reach Eritreans. The nations are in your neighborhood. The world is on your street. The cities are populated with culture shapers and movers and shakers. And the cities are disproportionately populated with the have-nots, the poor, the marginalized, the disenfranchised the least of these. And if we want to embody the Look For Manifesto to announce and embody good news to the poor, then we need to embrace the city. It's all there in Isaiah 54. But how do we respond? Fourthly, go all in, no strings attached. The prophet, speaking on behalf of the Lord, addresses issues of shame and fear and says, do not hold back. Do not hold back. Now's not the time for timidity. 
Now is not the time for conservative calculation. Now is the time to go all in and to surrender to the Lord of mission. So will you? Will you? We're here for a great impartation. We're here to be infused with the affection of Jesus, the power and anointing of the Holy Spirit, propelled into greater experience of the freedom that Jesus purchased with his blood. Anointing, anointing, anointing. So cherish the oil. Ask for more oil. But are you a consecrated vessel? So when I read the Old Testament, our team goes through the Bible in a year together. And we go through some really gnarly, boring bits of the Bible together. A friend of mine says, all Scripture is inspired, but not all Scripture is equally inspiring. I, I, and I've I got to agree with him. You know, when you look at Leviticus and badger skins and the tabernacle, I go, wow, that's going to get me through the day. Thanks, Lord. <laughs> but I, I was looking at the priests being set apart for ministry, and they would receive an anointing oil. But prior to that, they were to be consecrated. And the challenge for you and me in professional vocational ministry, we can become entitled and grumpy and succumb to the routinization of charisma. Corey Ten Boom went and spoke to a bunch of missionaries and her opening talk said it all to these full-time vocational career missionaries. Full-time missionaries, part-time Christians. So you can be a full-time apostle prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher. You can be a full-time missionary. But hear what the Lord's saying. Are you a full-time Christian? Are you really holy, fully mine? Or are you holding back? Are you following Jesus on mission with preconditions and missing the blessing and missing the breakthrough and missing the influx of new life, that wild infusion of new life? I'd like to pray. Take a few silent moments. I'd like to pray for you.